Hey everyone, Sunnyvale here. Before we get started with episode 36 of FECast, Everyone is Trash and the Mindset of Improvement, I just want to say a few things. First off, uh, Stormblust was not around for this one. He had some business to take care of. So uh, this is a solo cast and, and an idea that's been bouncing around in my mind for a while that I really wanted to get out there because I think it's really important. And uh, while the title does sound conceited and maybe preachy, I'm really not saying that in order to try to put people down. I'm more saying it really just to show how much room for improvement there is in everyone's gameplay, and uh, that includes myself. And finally, before we start the cast, I have some patrons to thank. FECast is made possible by our patrons over at Patreon.com. You can go to Patreon.com slash Friends of Eternal if you would like to donate. And uh, we have a new patron this month, so thank you, Ryder, for supporting the cause, joining the ranks of Outside Bava, Sigma Tank, Work Dunson, Camomilk, Chrissier, D-Dub, and Yeast Out. Thank you so much to these fine folks, and it's because of them that we're able to have great things such as FECast. One last thing, if you're not already a part of the Discord, the FE Discord is the best place to get better at Eternal. Link is in the description. Tons of people happy to help others out with all things Eternal every day. All right, without any further ado, let's get into episode 36 of FECast. Everyone is trash at this game and the mindset of improvement. Hello everyone and welcome to EffieCast episode 36, Everybody is Trash and the Mindset of Improvement. I am your host, Sunnyvale, and today we're going to be talking about how to get better at getting better at your game. Now let's first address the elephant in the room, the title. Uh, I, I don't mean that everyone is terrible at this game, I'm just trying to say that everyone has a lot of room to improve, and that goes for everyone from people that are just starting out, but also some of the people that are considered the best in the game, I think they have a lot of room improved in their games. I'm going to talk about that a lot, what what difficulties there are in, in card games and, and how to try to make the most out of, well, basically small sample sizes of everything. I include myself among this list of people that have a lot of room to improve. Uh, I don't want to people thinking that I'm trying to say that I'm better than everyone else because I'm definitely not, and there's a lot of things that I can do to improve my play and I make mistakes all the time. So uh, let's get down to it. So there's a lot of information out there about how to get better at Eternal, whether it be draft guides, constructed guides, uh, deck lists, videos, all sorts of things, and they're all good. I, I, I'm not trying to say they're not useful, but if you don't have the right mindset when going into that type of environment, I think that you'll find that, uh, well, I, you won't find it, but you won't make as much improvement as you could with the right mindset. And I think there's a lot of things to realize that I'll be talking about today if you want to get better at getting better. Uh, I, I know that sounds circular, but uh, trust me, this, this mindset is really important for actually making tangible improvements improvements to your game. If you don't have this mindset, honestly, I, I, I feel like you're not getting the full value out of your practice, your, uh, your reading, the stuff that you read, videos that you watch that help you improve. Just knowing that you do have a lot of space to improve in all facets of your gameplay, I think it's going to go a long way in order to help that. All right, so let's start with card games as a base. So card games, the art of playing well in card games boils down to trying to extrapolate real conclusions from a very small sample size. I mean, I think the, the reason why we love card games and the reason why uh, people who play card games tend to get addicted to them is because games aren't the same twice. Like, there are so many different possibilities of what can happen during a game, and so many different possibilities of what you can do to change your deck, or uh, what happens in the late game. There's there's just so many different things that can happen, so many situations that you can find yourself in, that it's impossible to actually have a good large sample size in order to make definitive conclusions. Everything that you say about, oh, this card is good, or this deck is good, or this deck needs this many cards, this many of this card in it, uh, or, or like this play is better, stuff like that is always, almost always going to be extrapolated from sample sizes that are too small to make those types of conclusions. And that's definitely, the, the extrapolation is definitely a skill. It's something that you can get better at and uh, uh, about like predicting based on, you know, based on how I see this card function in a few games, I can uh, maybe get better at, at 
determining how good it's going to be in the long run. But ultimately, it's it's a really difficult thing to do. And I think that uh, a lot of things are stated with an amount of certainty that just really is not something that you can say with the, the amount of sample size uh, that we get. Examples of this, including games not going the way that you expect based on the matchup, or uh, like, you know, you can, in, in, any, in any one game, anything can happen. You can draw way too much power and not be able to do anything, or you can draw the perfect t cards at the exactly the right time and be unbeatable and there's everything in between and, and, uh, and someone who is not great at the game can beat someone that is incredibly skilled at it. Uh, you see this in tournaments where brackets of tournaments just don't break the way that they're supposed to. There are lots of upsets and and like I said before anything can happen and uh, drafts are perhaps the most wild card of all these wild cards. Uh, anything can happen in a draft. I think that's what pe keeps people coming back to them, um, every experience is different. Uh, you have a different deck every single time. The cards that you have with which to build your deck is different every single time. So making definitive conclusions is incredibly difficult in draft. One other big thing is that you always have an incomplete view of the match um, unless you're watching two people play um, and you somehow know both people's hands because uh, you only have the view usually of your own actions of what you can do differently there. You don't see, like, if your opponent drew their second time source a turn earlier, they would have, the, the game would have shaped up a lot differently because they would have been able to play something on a turn where they didn't do anything, or... Um, maybe your opponent made a play that was perhaps questionable. It didn't look questionable at the time, but if they had made a different play, uh, things could have ended up being very different. So all of this is basically saying that there are an incredible number of possibilities with what, what can happen in a card game, such as Eternal, this applies to Magic, Hearthstone, whatever, any card game, there's just an incredible number of possibilities of what can actually end up happening, and you're expected to try to use the experience, the small number of experiences that you can experience during your finite life to, to try to to try to come up with broad conclusions on how to get better, how good cards are, and whatnot. And uh, this is also reinforced by the fact that there's always a winner in the card game, there's always a winner and a loser, so no matter what decisions someone makes, even if they're not possibly not the best ones, or, or possibly, you know, not so great, there's always going to be a positive reinforcement for the winner and a negative reinforcement for the loser, and those that reinforcement isn't necessarily uh, applied, isn't assigned the right way. So you have to be really careful with things like that, with positive and negative reinforcement for uh, beliefs of card evaluation, beliefs of uh, gameplay, like decisions and gameplays. So uh, it's really tough. So that reinforcement is going to lead to a lot of confirmation bias. You'll see people who win, you know, four games in a row with a deck and all of a sudden think that they're a stud because they the game is telling them yeah you won four games in a row with with this strategy um maybe seven maybe ten however many games it's it's really open-ended for what the results can be and how they affect uh, a person so so there are a lot of people that um you know might be doing something that isn't as good as it could be but still getting rewarded for it and that leads to a lot of confirmation bias that their beliefs are truths and uh, that is going to end up to a lot of people who overestimate the abilities and a lot of the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect, for, for those people that don't know, I'm just going to read a clip from Wikipedia, is a type of cognitive bias in which people believe that they are smarter and more capable than they really are. Essentially, low ability people do not possess the skills needed to recognize their own incompetence. Now, Again, I'm not trying to say that people are bad and should feel bad. I'm just trying to say that there are a lot of room for improvement. And I hope that some of the points that I brought up help illustrate the fact that we're all trying to extrapolate from not enough information. And there's a lot of room to improve. Like, we could think that we're at the top of our games. You could win tournament after tournament after tournament, but if the level of your competition is is not that high like you can't see the fact that you have a lot of room to improve all you see is that you know you're beating people that are not quite as good as you or whatnot recognizing that there is a lot of room to improve in almost all facets of the game is just a really important mindset to be in in order to challenge your beliefs and learn something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to learn based on your own limited experience so it might seem like semantics but 
just the language that you use of having that doubt baked into it, I think it's really important in order to, you know, appreciate that you don't have the full picture in front of you and, and what you're working with is incomplete information. There is room for doubt and that means room for growth. So when I say that we're all trash at this game, imagine a sliding scale uh, from 1 to 100 where 1 is uh, absolutely decisions at random and 100 is absolute perfect decisions based on like impossibly difficult statistics and, and probabilities and and just being absolutely perfect at the game um i i would say that the best players and this like everything else is conjecture and and based off of a sample size that is too small and as someone that cannot see you know all the way through the end of the tunnel for where this is based on my estimation i suppose i think that the best players in the game are like a 60 out of 100. Now that seems really low, but I really think that everyone has a ton of room to improve. But and 60 out of 100 is really good when you're playing against a lot of people that are like 40s or 30s. Now these numbers are totally made up. I don't know how much the improvement is I, I just know that I have a lot of improve. And I see other people's play and I think they have a lot of room to improve as well. Um, I don't know how far this tunnel extends. I don't know how good one would be if they were absolutely perfect, but I'm just confident that nobody in the game has reached that point or is even approaching that point. Um, so I'm, I'm just guessing that we're like 60s out of 100, and that means that we have a lot of room to improve. So this all might be pretty discouraging. <laughs> I mean, uh, I've basically spent the last however many minutes telling people that I think they're trash, um, <laughs> which isn't really like, again, I'm just trying to get, trying to communicate a <laughs> point here. Um, but if you look at the people who are at the extreme top of the game, the people who I'm saying are 60s out of 100, you look at someone like the boxer who absolutely tore up the ECQ in competitive scene this year. You look at players like uh, Jock D who has made almost every ECQ top 64 and made the finals and has had extremely consistent and good results. Uh, you can see that there, despite like the fact that I'm, I might not never become a complete player, uh, despite that, there's a lot of room to help your play and actually make a tangible improvement on the results you have. Yes, there is a lot of probability and luck going and uncertainty going into every tournament, but that just means that the people that have that edge are going to consistently perform better. I mean, it all comes down to statistics. Talk about that a little more. Once you have this mindset that you have a lot of room to improve, that is when you'll start making big improvements to your play. You'll notice things that you didn't notice before. You'll notice lines of play that you could have taken. You'll notice deck building decisions that you weren't, you didn't think were possible. You'll notice that there are different avenues in draft that are, are viable that you may have dismissed before. All right, so make sure you challenge your beliefs. That's the first step in order to make positive change in your gameplay. Once you say with certainty, oh, there was nothing I could have done in that game in order to win it, or you say, my deck is perfect, or you say, this card is bad in draft and I'll never play it. Once you say that, you are shutting the door on improving with regards to that play, that deck, that that your gameplay, what have you. There are so many times that I've seen people say there was nothing I could do in that game. They send me a video of their gameplay and I think to myself, well, this definitely could have happened, which would lead to this, which would lead to this, and then all of a sudden that, you know, drawing six power at the end of the game in a row uh, doesn't end up happening. And there was actually a lot that could be done and, and they might have been able to win that game, not not necessarily easily, but like with a good reasonable amount of certainty. And uh, if you're saying that there's nothing you can do, then you're closing your mind to the possibility that there is other things that you can do that someone else might be able to see and and make changes in order to help with, help with your game. Now, of course, in card games, there are those times where there is actually nothing you can do. Your opponent just drew like God and they're unbeatable, but that is overrepresented in people's recounts of games and and less it, it happens less often than people say it does really and by a lot too i mean i i think that there's a very low percentage of the game where players actions actually don't impact their outcome. I think it's really important to use a different set of language here. You hear a lot of certainty out of card game players and I think this is largely 
due to the reinforcement that people get from winning or losing game. Uh, you hear that a certain card is correct or that a certain strategy is optimal. And while this isn't always false. I feel like those types of words are thrown about far, far, far too often and really impede people's growth in the game. Like sure, there are definitely cards that are draft fodder that are not playable and constructed and playing them is definitely wrong, but there are, there's a lot more uncertainty than I think people are willing to give about certain cards. I think that um, I'm most famous for Taller's Intervention. A lot of people said that <laughs> was completely wrong, but um, um, I think that, like, a lot of the times, these choices, uh, especially in deck construction, that look questionable from the outside might have a lot more merit than people are giving alternatively plays that make about being right or not right. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot more uncertainty than, than people credit. The most dangerous thing that you can do is to surround yourself with people that agree with you because that reinforces the certainty that you have, which means that you're not going to make other considerations, which means that you're not going to be presented with new information, which means that your beliefs are going to change, which means that you aren't going to grow in your playing ability. One more comment on that, like, if you buy into the idea that every player has a lot of room to grow, any time your beliefs are locked down in stone, that means that you are giving up the possibility of growing and, and reaching that potential, reaching that improvement that everyone has. So when you have a group that is surrounding you that is saying the same things that you do and your, your, your beliefs are constantly being reinforced and reinforced and reinforced, that's a really dangerous thing to have happen because then, well, then and then, like I said before, your beliefs might get more locked. Uh, so I, from personal experience, uh, I was on Eternal Titans with Manu S, uh, Kamato, Tobo, and uh, a bunch of other great players uh, several years ago. And this was my first experience being around a lot of really good players. And you would think that, you know, good players have the same opinions of the game. Uh, but it really wasn't that. The, the chat was constant disagreement about uh, how to play, what certain cards were good in certain decks, which decks were good. There was just constant disagreement. And it was one of the best learning experiences for me as far as being a card game player. So I really recommend not necessarily like getting into arguments, but like getting into discussions with people that you disagree with. Uh, because if you don't, if you, if you, if you lock down, like I said, if you lock down your beliefs in stone, you're going to lose out on the improvement that, that you could otherwise attain. The eternal community being really small is nice because you get to know, get to know everyone and whatnot, but it also kind of inhibits growth and, and innovation within it because I, I find a lot of the time the people that are well connected to the eternal community start to think the same way and then you'll have someone that really doesn't participate in as many of the discussions in, in the ECQs come with a deck that is totally different from what everyone else is doing, not necessarily because they're trying to keep it a secret, but because they're not locked into that ecosystem where everyone is discussing things and people come down to conclusions about decks and, and whatnot. Like, uh, I think that a really good example is, uh, I, I think the player was Knife Bloom, who did really well with the deck in ECQ once that was just totally different from what everyone else was doing. Um, I don't remember the exact details, I just remember that they were on a Huru deck that was like a, a faction pair that was completely absent from, from the rest of the bracket. Or or um, or situations where like Colacoma and I'm So Bad were the only two people playing Reanimator in uh, that one ECQ and end up, ended up meeting in the finals. There's so much room for innovation that is not part of discussion involved in the community that I think it's important to break away from that uh, when you can because, because you end up seeing these results where um, people that are doing something different end up doing really well. Um, so all this circles back to challenging your beliefs and challenging the ongoing like community consensus, I suppose, of what people think about certain decks, cards, draft picks, whatever, and anything, because there is room to innovate, there is room outside of that in order to explore other possibilities, and uh, once you break away from all of this reinforcement, I think that really frees you up in order to try to come to your own conclusions and then compare them with what other people are saying. So one other thing that goes with breaking away from this echo chamber that the community kind of becomes is to reject the narrative and rely on cold hard probability. Uh, so a lot of the times you'll hear things like, um, this player is good at day twoing and chokes in this round or whatever, or like they're very good in the bracket up until this point. I've heard that also, like making it to the top 16 or something like that. 
and then always lose or or certain decks aren't good for ladder or certain decks are ladder decks versus tournament decks and there actually is a bit of truth to that one but it's not nearly as impactful as I think people would have you believe there's also like there's a good deck for day one that isn't good for day two and vice versa um I think all of these just come down to narratives that are trying to read into small sample size and like you should just rely on probabilities. A good play is a good play because it maximizes your chance of winning. A good deck is a good deck because it has a high win rate. It doesn't matter if it's open deck lists or closed deck lists. I, I, I just feel like while there are perhaps subtle differences to narratives like that, they are overblown in how big of an impact they have and when you're in any sort of doubt and when you're trying to consider any sort of these types of things rely on probabilities if someone has been crushing it in day one of MQ, if they have you know an 80 percent win rate over five ecqs and they've never made it past the round of 64 well the sample size you get from the round of the 64 is a lot smaller than the sample size of them crushing people in day one of an ecq and plus, I mean, like, the the, pos the probability of making top 8, assuming everything else is equal, uh, the probability of making top 8 once you've made top 64 is like 1 in 8. How many players have actually top 64 at 8 ECQs? Well, those people only have one expected top 8. So um, I think a lot of the time there is a narrative of things that should happen or, or things that work a certain way because of uh, kind of a hand wavy argument. I think it's really important to try to reject those narratives and to really round yourself in probabilities of like, well, I kept a two power hand. I'm definitely like, I should never keep a two power hand because I never draw a third power on time. Well, actually, yeah, you draw the third power on time, like roughly 50% or 60% of the time, depending on when you're, uh, whether you're going first or second. I, those, those, those problems were just totally made up. I <laughs> didn't have a calculator in front of me, but, um, but it's remarkable to me how many people that are really good at math and really good at, well, good at the game and good at math, just start buying into certain narrative that kind of work against what math is trying to tell you is the most expected outcome and I don't know like I guess they even start to believe that these things are true based on a really small sample size like I said everything in card games is relying on too small of a sample size in order to try to come up with uh, real conclusions and I think these narratives have a lot to do with it so my recommendation is just to simply reject these narratives. When it comes down to it, just think of things in terms of simple probabilities and mathematical likelihoods. And one last thing that compounds this issue of narratives is that these things get bounced around in echo chamber really easily. It's easy to latch onto an idea and then like spread that and then, you know, it sounds good so people spread it further. Anyway, reject the narrative. I think it'll serve you well in the long run. All right, let's get on to some actual tangibles that you might be able to improve on. Let's start with deck building. So something that, again, I, I firmly believe that there are better de versions of the decks out there. There is, for every great deck that has ever been created, there is a better version of it just waiting to be found. And uh, just like as a way to express doubt, you see a lot of deck lists that have four of a lot of cards. And it turns out that like a lot of cards are not actually that great in multiples. Like when you have three of a card in your hand versus three different cards in your hand, uh, you your number of options uh, d is is decreased. Like you only have those three options. Now, granted, that might be those that card might be much more powerful than the other two cards that it could be for comparing a three of a kind versus three different cards. Um, but even even so, a lot of the times the option is so valuable to make sure that you're doing the most impactful play that you can make at the at the right time that it's better to have those three options, even if two of them are lesser in a vacuum, than three of the generically powerful card. Like the optimal deck list probably has a lot of one ofs, a lot of three ofs, and a lot of two ofs. I think that it's easy to make a deck that has four ofs, and it's easy to rely on certain synergies to come to, but I think that's not the right number. I don't think that's the actual correct configuration a lot of the time. Now, we don't have the time in order to make versions of decks that are exact. Like, if a tournament is coming up this weekend, I can't can't boil down exactly how many cards uh, that I should have one copy or have two copies of in order to fit in the deck. But the important thing to know is that there are better versions of the decks out there.
it is a thing that can be improved. You hear a lot of the time, this is this is something that kind of gets on my nerves. You hear a lot of the time, someone after a tournament says, oh, my team had the best deck, or I had the best deck in the room. Well, first of all, you didn't have the best version of the deck that you built, or, or like the correct version of the deck. You didn't have the best version of the deck that you built. And that's really, that's that statement is usually not done with enough evaluation of what the other decks in the room are. Anyway, this is basically me saying always look for ways to improve the deck because they are they are there. And another thing, I mentioned this earlier, is that different archetypes, it's not just boiled down to if someone releases a tier list, the, the decks that are good are not just going to be the decks that are on that tier list. There's always an unknown deck out there that's waiting to be discovered that can do well. You see this uh, pretty frequently, like a deck that is not a known quantity until a tournament and then all of a sudden it has a breakout moment. And sometimes that's because the deck is being kept under wraps, but it's also sometimes just because a deck is not being, is not something that's circulating in the community. Uh, I, I talked about echo chambers, but also like when you're playing opponents on ladder, um, you're you're giving visibility to your deck, and and basically like it's kind of contagious with with which decks are being displayed at any time. Anyway, um, getting on a little bit of a tangent here. Um, I think a couple examples of this are when Twinbound won ECQ with uh, a Combray aggro deck. I think they were like the only person to play Combray aggro. It wasn't seen as a deck that was very viable in, in the days of even Elysian ECQ. And and another example is when I won the Throne Championship with Monofire. I think I was the only... I, I think there were, might have been one other Monofire in the top 64, but it definitely was a deck that people were saying things like, this is not a real deck. Um, and the, well, it turns out there is room to innovate. There's room to find that uh, find those cards that work together, find the ratios of which cards that are necessary in order to make a certain deck to function. So ultimately, you're not going to be able to find the best version of the deck, but every improvement does matter. And what I'm trying to say is keep looking. Keep making modifications to that deck, keep tinkering, keep on trying new things if you have the time and or inspiration to do so. I know some, this is a process that is incredibly time, but don't be satisfied with what your list is. Always be making changes. Don't, don't be afraid to revert those changes either. Like, I mean, not every change is going to be a positive, but there is a better version of the deck that you're playing out there and it's out there for you to find. And it's also incredibly important to have a good deck. Like, uh, I, I think that Patrick Chapin illustrated this in an article once you know if if you're rolling a d8 and i'm rolling a d10 i have an inherent advantage and and vice versa like if you're rolling a two d6s and i'm rolling a d12 then all of a sudden i'm disadvantaged like think of decks that way obviously there's a lot more to it but like it does boil down to how good is your deck it, it's you can basically say that um a deck that is better than another one is just like using a dice that goes up higher uh, has more potential to get to a higher number and win um or like having a deck that's more consistent is like rolling more of the same dice anyway um i hope that makes some amount of sense kind of arbitrary <laughs> Um, but the better version of the deck is out there. It's up to you to find it. And if you do, it will help your results a good amount. And don't believe people when they say that this deck is correct. This is the correct configuration of the deck. It might be the best configuration of the deck that people have found so far, but that doesn't mean it can't be improved. All right, let's talk about gameplay next. I did an FE cast episode with Collector. Uh, Collector, of course, is the only player to qualify for Worlds twice. No, one of two, I suppose. Eric did it as well. Um, and I guess Adrius is qualified for both Worlds through winning worlds in 2019 but collector won two ecqs and has some of the best gameplay that is out there internal and we we spent an entire episode talking about how you can actually improve your gameplay how the people that are playing the best are still making mistakes and can do better um so just because you know a good player tells you that this play is right or whatever yeah they might be right about that play but it's not like that every play they're going to make be better so again challenge your beliefs try to find something so there are ways of figuring out how to do this the first is that there are probably lines that you're not considering and they they could be correct, like things that are unintuitive, uncommon scenarios where you might need to kill your unit in response to something or fire off that torch for a non-lethal amount of damage in order to get your opponent within striking distance before they get face aid. These are lines that are worth considering and sometimes they actually are the, the right thing to do and sometimes they have a lot more merit than you would expect based on your experience. So always try to consider other lines, try to consider like every line possible. Even if it's terrible, even if it's terrible, try to consider every line possible. It's a good practice in order to seeing the different things that you can do for the off chance that one of those
those things is actually what you want to do. Um, you can't come up with the right play. Like if you're deciding between two plays, if you're deciding between play A and B, um, but play C is the correct one is or is the best one, you can't pick the right one if you don't see it. So make sure you're taking a look at all the other things that you could have done differently, even if they seem terrible at the time, because sometimes they're going to end up being better than the things that you are considering uh, on your own. Another thing that's really important in gameplay is slow down. I mean, <laughs> we talked about this a lot. I, I feel like it is there's not enough time. Most of the time, there's not enough time within a turn to make the correct play. I think that people should be roping almost every single turn. Um, I know that that makes for a miserable experience with card games if your opponent's constantly roping, but like if you're in a tournament situation and everything is do or die, you, you need to consider your options, consider what's going on in your opponent's hand more than you are. And, and I mean, I definitely make tons of mistakes for playing too fast. I know that, oh, I see it all the time. I see like, I see people making plays and sometimes like not even plays that I disagree with play, but plays like if, if I'm watching a game in real time, I see a play and it's like, wow, I really would have considered that line a lot longer than that player did um, because it's not as cut and dry as I think that it's made out to be. It is helpful to have certain things like, you know, killing a turn one initiative of the sands, situations where, you know, if your opponent has a lot of units, definitely play the harsh rule as early as you can. It is useful to have those shortcuts to fall back on, but sometimes that can also cause people to not consider other lines of play that they could have made that might have been better given that situation. Oh, I think another good example of this, I was doing a breakdown of my finals match with Keith Peleg back in the Throne Championship and Keith Peleg made a crazy play. It was when they were, they were super low on life and they used a display of ambition to not kill a very large unit on my side of the board, but instead get a reason. And I immediately chalked that up as a misplay, but then I thought about it for a few minutes. I was like, wait a second, I think this was the right play. I think that this is the play that helped Keith Pele get to the line that was actually going to help them win the game, um, as opposed to something that just looked good at the time. Anyway, so take, take more time thinking about those lines of plays, especially Especially when it's a do or die. Uh, and, and finally, the big one that I think that people don't realize they have power over, make sure you're spending way more time on your keep or redraw decision. It is the most important decision you make in the game. We talked about it a lot in the episode where Collector and I were talking about gameplay. One of the, uh, sometimes that keep button says lose the game, period, when you click. And it's up to you to figure out exactly, or figure out if it says that. And I see a lot of people clicking that button when it says lose the game. If you keep a hand that doesn't work, you will lose. So you really need to make sure that you take a lot of time on that decision because I, it is the most important that you have. Consider it just because, you know, a hand has a certain amount of power and a certain amount of cards, even if those cards are good, you really have to consider, is this what I need in order to be in this game and potentially win? All right, let's move on to draft. So we don't usually talk about draft, uh, on this podcast, but I think it's just really important to recognize that there are so many different things going on. The reason people love draft is because no two experiences are the same, right? You never get past the same pack twice, or at least like very rarely. You certainly don't have the same cards in your pool and the pack that you're looking at. So like every evaluation is going to be different and something that you have to make on the fly. So if you are stuck in a rigid way of card evaluation, or if you are used to drafting you know, just always prioritizing one one faction or whatever. I, I know that I fall victim to this myself a lot. Um, that is going to lead to decisions that aren't as good as some of the decisions that you could have made instead. Every game of limited, every pick is a new scenario and it's up to you to try to figure out how to adapt to that scenario and come up with a better way of playing the game. A good example of this is when you are past your third pack and say that there is a card so so on your third pick of the first pack um and say that you are in two situations that are similar one where um you know this happened in the past and then another one where you have the same first two picks and the same same exact pack is exact um same 10 cards looking at that pick is different than the one that you made before because 
of the cards that were passed to use pack. There's just more to consider than I think that people realize. There's more room to get a bigger picture and get more context, be able to make a more informed decision. Um, and just go back to what I was saying before, you could misread a signal or end up making a decision that might be impacting you later on. And it's always uncertain, especially in draft, how much that, you know, your signal reading is actually correct. How, how correct is your signal reading? How much of an impact is that going to have on the future things? Some things, sometimes things just don't go as planned, right? So as Especially for draft, there is so there's always more to and I'm not going to claim that I have a great grasp of the situation. I'm just trying to say that, you know, there's there's a lot more to it than I think people normally realize. And I think that just recognizing it, recognizing how many different things can happen, uh, really helps you start to consider those things, which will then in turn improve your game. Again, drafting, there's you get past the pack and there's no time limit. People like to draft fast. I like to draft draft fast. Um there are are more things than you can possibly consider going on in draft uh, in every pick. And like, if you were to try to draft optimally, you probably, it would probably take days and days to finish just one draft process. But if you're looking to improve, that also means that there's more to consider. There are more things that you figure out how to uh, figure out to your draft picks. And then also for gameplay, your deck, your deck is different every time. Your opponent's deck is different every time. There's a lot that can be done. There. Another thing is uh, people's draft picks. Like if I evaluate a card a certain way that is part of an entire ecosystem of my card evaluations. I think that's really difficult to compare two people's evaluations of a single card head to head. Because if, for example, if I think that a certain primal common is really bad and someone else thinks it's really good, well, if I'm not taking another like primal card or maybe a certain faction pair that makes this card better, um, it doesn't matter if I if like I'm convinced that I should be taking this card, that card's still going to be bad because the rest of my evaluations don't allow for that card to shine. So like, it's really important to realize that everyone's draft advice is based on a carefully balanced ecosystem and a sample size that is too small based on how their drafts have gone, how their, how, you know, a different cards that that player evaluates, how they evaluate them, and even like what other people are drafting at the time. There's just so much going on there that, man, <laughs> I think that saying someone else's draft picks are, or, or, or drafting strategy is like wrong is one of the most dismissive things that you can say out there and, and something that you should definitely avoid because there's a bigger picture out there. There's always a bigger picture. And especially in draft, there's that's where the picture I feel like probably the biggest. I don't know. I guess there's a pretty big picture in constructed. Again, I should reiterate, all I'm trying to say is that there is room for improvement and seeing that there is that room proof is a big part, making sure that you are able to make the most out of your new experiences and evaluate them in a new way. Because once you're locked into a certain way of thinking, that is when you stop having this potential. One final aspect of the game that I want to talk about uh, where I, I feel like people don't really recognize how much they can improve is reading what your opponent is doing and reading not only what they're planning on doing, but also what they have available and in their hand. So uh, obviously this is incredibly difficult and not something that I can claim to be an expert on because you can't see your opponent's cards. You don't know what they drew when. You can try to infer it. It's incomplete science. And even if you are making good steps, like how you're reasoning what they have, because they might have chosen to do something differently than you would have if you were in their situation with the resources that they had, in their situation because you don't know like what your opponent's inclinations necessarily are you don't know exactly what they're going to do or how they're going to respond given the situation but this is something that like you can infinitely get better at. Uh, once i was watching an lsv draft and he said you know you should just play intuitive if you think your opponent has something that they probably have it and this was a long time ago way before i was any good at card games just like what the heck does that mean play intuitively uh, but eventually if you play into if you run to enough hailstorms if you play into enough harsh rules you hit enough negates uh, stuff like that you're you eventually get to develop a, a, a sense of what your opponent is doing what how they're setting it up and what what certain setups look like now that's a that's a pretty slow way of doing it I think that trying to do this based on experience alone takes a lot of falling face first into whatever you're, that you're trying to avoid there is a better way of doing this that speeds up the process
your opponent is likely has an agenda in mind for what they're trying to do in the game and what plays they're trying to make and, and what they're trying to set up. I talked about this with Collector on our episode, but like if your opponent plays uh, depleted power turn one, depleted power turn two, they might be setting up for a big turn three play. Like if they only have one undepleted power, maybe they're trying to make it count on turn three. Hold on just a second there, editing Sunnyvale, stepping in just to say, unfortunately, the rest of this episode, the audio for it was uh, kind of chopped up by the truncate silence effect of Audacity, and I actually can't use it, and um, I don't have the time to recover it. So uh, my apologies for that. I'll definitely talk about this topic, about reading opponents more in the future, but that's going to be it for this week's episode of FECast. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it didn't come off as being too conceited or too preachy, because I know that I can definitely do that. I can definitely trend in that direction sometimes, but uh, this is this is what I think is the most important thing as far as getting better goes. This is the most important tool you can have to get better, is to have the right mindset, have that doubt of... of not only like your own ability, but the abilities of other people and really just constantly be real evaluating of uh, with the information that you get. I know that a lot of people out there disagree with me. And uh, if, if they do, like, I'm, I'm happy to hear what people think. I mean, a disagreement is an opportunity to reevaluate and, and see you know, see another point of view and, uh, you know, come to a different conclusion, hopefully one that's a little better. So, uh, yeah, please let, let me know what you think. Next week, uh, I guess it's this week at this point, we have a, a, a summer challenge for Expedition and we'll probably be talking about that. I don't know if we can get another episode out uh, before the week's end, but uh, we've got tournaments coming up and that's always exciting. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, until next time, I will see you in the friend zone. The Friends of Eternal Discord is the best place on the internet to get better at Eternal. We have players of all skill and experience levels all happy to help each other out on basically any aspect of their Eternal gameplay. And making all this possible is our generous patrons over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to support FECast or Friends of Eternal, consider donating at Patreon.com slash Friends of Eternal. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, we'll see you in the Friends Zone.